Dear friends, there is an old saying, do not bite the hand that feeds you. This saying highlights the fact that one should not be unkind and ungrateful to the person who provides. But many of us do disregard or ignore such wise counsel. We not only tend to forget those who help and support us, but treat them with great scorn and much contempt. However, while we human beings might behave in an ungrateful way, God is not like that. God is faithful. When we say God is faithful, it means that He is totally trustworthy and dependable. God's faithfulness is true and has been proven many times. The Bible is full of God's promises and reminders that He is faithful and that He cannot lie nor can he break a promise. More than any other writing prophet, Isaiah repeatedly speaks of God's perfect faithfulness and today's first reading contains a similar message. Friends, before going any further, let us briefly look at the historical context of Isaiah's time. About 900 years before Jesus, after King Solomon's death, the kingdom of Israel had been split into two. The kingdom of Israel, which was made up of ten tribes of the Israelites, and Samaria as its capital in the north, and the kingdom of Judah, which consisted of two tribes, and Jerusalem as its capital in the south. Isaiah, one of the greatest of the prophets, lived in Judah and prophesied in the days of four kings of Judah, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, 700 years before Christ. It shows that Isaiah appeared at a critical moment in Judah and in Israel's history. Friends, there are many wicked kings of Judah, but Ahaz was easily the most wicked. He was distinguished for idolatry and contempt for the true God of Israel, Yahweh. He even sacrificed his own children to pagan deities. However, his worst mistake was that he rejected the counsel of the prophet Isaiah and sought help from the king of Assyria to fight the kings of Aram and Israel who had allied to wage war against Judah. He also built idols of Assyrian gods in Judah to find favor with Assyria. The Assyrians captured the kingdom of Israel and carried away the ten tribes into captivity. But over the years, Judah also fell victim to the power struggles between Assyrians, Babylonians and Egyptians, with Jerusalem eventually destroyed around 587 BC. In fact, since the time of Ahaz, the Lord allowed many nations to attack Judah and its people because of their sin. He let their enemies plunder their possessions, demolish their houses, destroy their city and the temple. Friends, when the whole land of Judah, including Jerusalem, was becoming a wasteland without inhabitants and utterly desolate, the people of Judah began to wonder if God had forsaken them and done away with the covenant that he had made with Abraham, which was to give them the land of Canaan and to be a blessing to the rest of the world. It was during these times of distress that the prophet Isaiah started proclaiming that the Lord still loved and cared for them, that he had not forgotten his promises to Abraham and that he would someday restore them as a nation. Friends, Today's passage is part of the assurance which God gave to the Israelites concerning their future deliverance from Babylon and ultimate glory. It contains imageries or metaphors consistent with the figurative style of Isaiah's prophetic utterance. Friends, the passage begins by saying, For Zion's sake I will not be silent, for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her vindication shines forth like the dawn and her victory like a burning torch. 
Friends, here the personal pronoun I refers to God and Zion refers to Mount Zion on which the city of Jerusalem is built. The temple is built on Mount Moriah. Both names Zion and Jerusalem are interchangeable. Both refer to Israel as the people of God. Thus, speaking in the voice of God, the prophet assured the Israelites that though they had deserted God and his ways, he had not abandoned them. Rather, God would continue to speak and work on their behalf until they had vindication and victory. And that is, until they are cleared of blame and restored to their former glory, until their relationship with God and others is re-established. Moreover, the restoration and transformation of the land and the people of Israel will be highly visible like the sun at dawn or like a burning torch. Friends, Isaiah continues saying, Nations shall behold your vindication and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name pronounced by the mouth of the Lord. In other words, the prophet assured them that not only Israel as a nation would be restored, but that it would also be a visible reality. And even more so, it would be known to all the people, both to Jews and Gentiles, to ordinary and powerful people, even to the kings themselves. Moreover, the prophet told them that the Lord would give them a new name befitting Israel's new, redeemed, righteous status and position, just as he changed the name of Abraham to Abraham and Jacob to Israel. Besides, the prophet says, You shall be a glorious crown in the hand of the Lord, a royal diadem held by your God. In other words, Israel and its people, because of their righteousness and holiness, would be God's crown and one of God's proudest possessions, which he holds in his hands before the nations, and no one would therefore be in a position to harm them. Then the prophet uses the metaphor of marriage to testify of God's great love for Israel. He says, No more shall people call you forsaken, or your land desolate, but you shall be called my delight, and your land is spoused, for the Lord delights in you and makes your land his spouse. Friends, the Lord had already said that Israel would assume a new name, designating its future royal status. Now the Lord revealed to them what the name would be. While they had been known as forsaken, desolate, so far, because of their sin, shame, humiliation, rejection and abandonment, the Lord said that they would be known in the future as my delight, and their land married one. And finding delight in their life, he would marry their land. Friends, elaborating further on Israel's marriage relationship with God and the land, the prophet says, As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you, and as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall your God rejoice in you. In other words, the prophet said that God would delight in Israel as a bridegroom delights in his new bride, because Israel would no longer be forsaken, desolate, but a fruitful delight. Friends, what is the message for us? One. Even though Isaiah had revealed the Lord's plan for a grand restoration of Israel and Judah 700 years before Jesus, the process of rebuilding the temple and the city of Jerusalem began only around 539 BC, when the Israelites returned from the Babylonian exile on the orders of the Persian king Cyrus the Great following his conquest of Babylon. This was about 150 years after Isaiah's prophecy. However, the Lord's plan for Israel's restoration would be something far greater than their return from exile, the re-establishment of the city of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. It rather includes the spiritual restoration to God which was made necessary 
because of the fall of the first man, Adam. Friends, ironically, God had to prove himself to those he had chosen. Therefore, he sent his son Jesus Christ as a human person, who was also perfectly union with God, pre-existent with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit before Adam lived, holy, blameless and pure, into the world as the last Adam, not merely to restore us to what we were before the fall, a living being, but to make us righteous as he is. And Christ honored the authority of God the Father through complete obedience. Through his life, death and resurrection, he restored what was lost and guaranteed that we would never lose it again. Friends, even at this very moment, despite of wretchedness and complete lack of merit, Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father interceding for us, actively working for our greatness and comfort our righteousness and salvation. We must not forget that Jesus lived a holy life and then paid the price for sin through his death on the cross and he is now also interceding on our behalf. 2. Because of what Christ has done and is doing for us, we now have the opportunity to be in right relationship with God. Friends, through baptism, God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light and has given us a new name, Christian, that is, either from the name of Christ himself or perhaps like Peter, the Lord has given us a brand new name that represents the character or the change he has brought or wants to bring about in us. Thus, a new name also reminds us of a new relationship, new life, new character quality and new purpose. Friends, we never have to be ashamed of our name, but we praise God that we bear that name. God has given us a name so that we may make known among the Gentiles the glory of God, that we may set our hearts on heavenly things, not on earthly things, and that we may become a glorious crown and a royal diadem in his hand. As a matter of fact, and regardless of what we have been in the past, God delights in making us his spouse, for we have been made clean by the blood of Jesus. Friends, God knows all our faults even better than we do, yet he wants us as his bride. He rejoices over the thought of having us as his bride just as the young man rejoices over his bride when he is ready to get married. Friends, today we shall pray that we may allow Jesus to clean up our life, that we will be prepared to be married to God, that we will know God's great love for us, and that we will rejoice with God in our relationship with Him as He rejoices with us. Amen. God bless you.